So big welcome back to Bianca, who the co-founder of Tail, who will be your host again for this session. And I'm now delighted to introduce Mariam Jama, who very much inspired me the first time I heard her speak at an event about three years ago. I'm now very proud to say she's speaking at our own event today. Um, I strongly encourage you to ask her any questions you have, uh, again, in the chat or, or by raising your hand using the button at the bottom of your screens. Um, without any further ado, I pass over to Bianca for the session. Thank you so much for welcoming me, Tom. Uh, and welcome, Lee Mariam. It's a pleasure to have you. I've been stalking and following you uh, since you started I Am Code. And one of the biggest things that I wanted to talk about, I want us to get human today and talk about the... I want us to get human today and talk about you and talk about some of the words that come to mind when I think about you and when I think about um, resilience is one of the ones that comes to mind. This relentless desire to change and strive for the better. Tell me a little bit about what do you, what does a word mean to you when we are talking here about mission possible and it requires to be resilient to, to, to achieve it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've upgraded my title, so I've become a lady uh, from Senegal. So it's kind of like really new, but don't worry about it. Um, uh, what resilience means? I think for me, resilience means that um, uh, it's just because of what I've been through as a child. You know, most of you probably not know my story, but I, I had an extremely difficult upbringing as a as a young girl. So I didn't just end up here with you know, all the accolade and all of that. So um, I guess my resilience started when I was in uh, in France in the tube station uh, before the police picked me up. Uh, that's when I started to really realize that tomorrow will get better. Things will get better for me. And then keeping hope and knowing that if I if I have a fate and just just wait, take my time, that things will get better. So I'm always hoping that tomorrow will get better. Uh, that's, that's what resilience means to me. I don't let things do well for a long time and I don't think negatively because I'm so privileged and so lucky to be where I am today. So uh, that's, that's what I think about all the time. I think about the fact that I, I'm here. You certainly are, lady. Um, I think one of the things that really striked me um, as I look at the world and I look at how we're literally upside down at this moment, um, a lot of us are struggling. I'm talking to you from Brazil and we have over 50,000 people that have been directly impacted and deceased from this pandemic. And I think this is just a struggle that shows how broken our society truly is. And I think why initiatives like this really matter that show you that you can have a business and that you can have impact and you can care about the world you're around. When you think about some of this, um, this feeling that we're all struggling, what are some of the lessons or some of the things that you think are valuable for people listening out there that you have derived from overcoming such horrific things that have happened to you, but not letting them define you? Now, that's a very good question. You know, um, I, I love Brazil. I've been loving in Brazil. So I've been working there since 2009. And so Brazil is my my second home. Um, and so I, I Welcome. think <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> so it's my it's my second home, Brazil. And uh, and so I'm I'm very privileged actually and honored to work in Brazil and to be the first organization that have bought a um, an organization like I am the code where we go and work with marginalized communities. Uh, and and we you know we all the way to the Arizona. So I, I think I think if you look into the connection between, I, I, what I always say to people is that poverty, uh, you know, poverty and all of the stuff that's happening right now is a system. COVID nineteen, everything we're doing is is man made or been created by by something. And so, if if I look into Brazil and, and Africa, for example, and and the young girls I work with across the world. Uh, and I look at my situation, I'm 45 years old now, and, uh, and, and all the pain we have been through as children um, and, and the lack of education, the lack of privilege we have. Uh, the reason I'm so passionate about my work is because we need to go to those countries to help young girls and boys. Uh, society will not be the same again 
post COVID-19. Uh, so that's why I go and, and really meet people who are so desperate for help and support. And, and launch I Am The Code in Brazil, where we're now in seven cities. Uh, post COVID, before COVID-19, I was in Belo Horizonte, where we have uh, you know, our team there. And right now we're working with young girls uh, in Sao Paulo and Rio. And, um, and I, it just makes me very proud as an African woman to share uh, you know, the pain I've been through, but also to go and find all the pocket of of of, uh, of difficulty across the world and share that. So, and I think as a community and as a society, that's why I'm really proud of what Tom is doing here and bringing us all together. So am I. It's been a few years. Him and I were talking about cloud and infrastructure years ago, interviewing leaders, and it's so exciting to finally see that you can have both. You can have a heart, a soul, and an awareness and help people. So I know one of your philosophies is ask for help and is for this community to be collaborative. Tell us uh, and tell some of the entrepreneurs listening out there, how have you found successful ways of doing that? You've been involved in amazing projects with the UN and you've been doing things around the world. What is some of the basic criteria or framework that you've used to do that? I think first of all is, is be humble knowing that you don't know much um and a COVID-19 have showed all of us that actually we need each other more uh and we need to help each other more and post before COVID-19 I was in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya but the same the girls have the same feeling as the Brazilian girls and so I'm trying to get them to help one another and what I've learned is we are all the same at the end of the day and so you know, as leaders, we, because of our accolade and, and everything that is happening, people pumping us so many accolades, we need to realize at the end of the day, we are all vulnerable. We're all human beings. And so we need to be able to open up and, and ask for help. And I was saying yesterday uh, to Tom that, you know, post COVID-19, we need to be careful not to go back to our old ways. We are so lucky to be able to go to Davos, to be able to meet people like Tom, to, to have these opportunities we're doing right now, actually even connecting online. My girls don't have access to online. My girls right now sitting in Sao Paulo don't have access to connectivity. Uh, I have to send them money for them to connect. So I think we need to also look into our privileges, what we have, what we really have right now in our hand, that even if we can't go out, we are locked down, we need to be so appreciative to what we have because I know people don't have what we have. So that's why I'm asking for help for people to understand that life is not just hashtag on Twitter and Facebook, but actually it's reaching out like this. You know, the reason why I joined Tom because, and also uh, Tom, uh, the reason why I, I like giving this example, because when I was uh, invited at, uh, uh, at Web, Web Summit, he was so kind to me. He was loving and he was caring. He actually put my jacket on. And so if he, if, he, if he wasn't that kind and, and, and supportive, I wouldn't turn up to his, to his event. So we need to also think about being human beings, being polite, being collaborative, and being kind, being compassionate to one another. And this is how you build a relationship. And I hope that post COVID-19, we're gonna change a little bit our ways of working and pay, pay more attention, not to ourselves, but also pay attention to the poor people across the world. And, and because there are so many people who need our help. I, I, I commend you for saying these things. And it's the same reason why Tail is here. And we founded a company to bring literacy and technology literacy and, and financial literacy for Brazilians and people around the world is, is to, to, to sort of break those bridges um, and, and, and build new ones, right? Like break the barriers of entry and allow people to have um, what you said. I think something that you said is would you say that to entrepreneurs, one of the things you hope to see in a post-COVID new normal, which I hate the word, but uh, people are saying this is the new normal. I think it's it's something that should be our modus operandi, which is how do you treat other people and how do you make them feel more than what stats and what gain do you have? And I think I'd be curious to know your your opinion, Lady Marianne, in 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 how I think there is this 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 gap in the world where people still think that. Oh, you're, what you're doing is charity. What you're doing is really cute. And I think as, as a woman, I've certainly experienced this. It's like, oh, that's cute. And instead of really taking seriously, and I think part of the values of, of Whitetail and, 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 and Meaningful Business Partner is to show that mission possible, to show that you can have both. And I, I'd be curious to know your worldview on, 
on how do you think people are starting to see these businesses that can be sustainable, like I am code can be a sustainable and is actually not charity. It's actually the right thing to do. How, how do you think that, where are we in that fight uh, to bring that level of awareness and understanding that this isn't just cute or a nice thing to do, that this is actually the way the world should operate if we want an equitable, fair planet to live in? That's a very deep, deep question. And you are absolutely right. I agree with you. And I, by the way, there is no new normal. I think we should, this is us though, creating the new normal narrative. And I think we should stop using it because it's definitely, there is, we can't go back to normal. You know, most, many entrepreneurs have lost money. I mean, the disaster we have across the world, is just, we can't go back to normal. First of all, we are responsible for the language. So we need to change that. Uh, just refuse to, to adopt to this new normal uh, scheme because it's, it's not going to work. And I think we need to be more humble and say, we don't want to go back to normal. We don't know what normal is because your normal is not my normal. Uh, and then I think that ch talking about charities, you know, I am the code is not a charity. Uh, we are a foundation and the work we're doing in 68 countries, uh, 18,000 girls. The, the problem we have right now is that those young girls, we forgot them since I was a teen, I was a young girl being trafficked from Senegal. So we're responsible for changing the systems. And then what we're talking about right now is we, we can't just continue the way we're doing and add to this hashtag. For example, last week, you had the World Refugee Week. Every single person was were going online and hashtagging World Refugee Day or Black Lives Matters. And then after that, we forget what's happened. It looks like nothing happened, but racism still exists. It's a band-aid, right? You know, like, do you like, find that really we crazy. like yeah, usually yeah. look at it as a band-aid? I think one of the things that in this whole horrific sort of realization is how blind have we been to all of this? We need to do surgery. I think we need a more surgery, not band aid, but we need to go deep cell by cell. What I was saying to my mentees the other week is that we are all used to this new normal, we want to call it, because then you're going to start having all the newspapers, all the people talk about new normal, but we need to really sit down and do surgery, you know, look into details, details by details. What exactly do we need to do in education? The work you are doing in, in supporting organizations, what can we do to listen more? but also be more empathetic and kind to actually give you and give so many people a chance to actually speak up. Uh, and then I think we, that's what we need to do as a society right now. Um, we have a question, Marianne, if I'm gonna ask you uh, from Elle Marie. She says she agrees with both of us hating the new, new normal because I didn't think the world was normal to begin with. I think we had some fundamental flaws that a pandemic was just too strong of a force yeah. uh, that allowed us to see the cracks in our foundation and infrastructure, even in the values of how we operate today. Her question is, how can we, as meaningful business partners, support each other? How can we contribute towards a systems change? And I think I've been certainly uh, learning a ton about words and systematic versus systemic. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at what is it really required in this complex ecosystem that we we, as you said, how do we do surgery and how, how do we look at this as an opportunity to stand together? Yes, I think what we're doing right now is, is really interesting because uh, I think that's why, first of all, again, understanding the word systematic and systemic is really important. And again, the new normal. Do you want to provide people your perspective? Like, <laughs> absolutely. Marianne, absolutely. I, think absolutely. I mean, you enjoy that. I'm applying in system change. I love changing system. It is working policymakers. If you look into, just let me give an example about, I'm working on right now on Black Lives Matters. We create uh, racist ideas that, that lead to racist policies. And I think for many, many years, we, we have actually allowed these systems to happen. For example, in my country, Senegal, uh, you know, making sure that women have the right to for abortion, for example, is a systematic problem. But if you want to change this, you need to work with the government of Senegal, for example. Many, many ways. All the I can name so many examples of where systematic uh, we have systematic failure, where and systems have been adopted for years and years and years. And uh, and my job right now is to work with government and policymakers. And I really hope that this mission impossible can go in at the heart of government to change the policies uh, that are actually creating so many issues for all of us. We've been forgetting government. All of us are looking for entrepreneurship. You can, do, you can become an entrepreneur, do good. But I think one of the things you could do as an entrepreneur is actually to go and at the heart of government to say, I can develop this solution for you. Let me help you. Because they don't know. And then we've been waiting, 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 talking to the private sector. 
but we need to go at the heart of government to change the policies because if I can't change the abortion law in Senegal, many girls will be free. And, and we need to think about these small systematic changes at the heart of government, I think. So I, I, I couldn't agree more and, and, and certainly have done my fair share of the advocacy and currently the Brazilian government as in terms of what my expertise area is, which is identity and digital identity and giving people a right to be who they are, mm -hmm. um, which is the beginning of freedom if you sort of establish at a ground level. But it sounds scary to some people. So yeah. what are some of the tips or some of the ways you, I know you're resilient beyond <laughs> what the word can actually describe and to me is inspiring, but what are some of the tangible ways that you would advise young women? Uh, and this is another question that we have from Maria. How, how can young entrepreneurs really approach these big worldwide organizations or even their local government? How are they, is it a matter of their self-awareness or their perspective on their worth? Because Sometimes I know I've been scared to say, maybe is it what I have to say relevant for my government and thinking that this is this big, scary thing. How have you sort of overcome that and how do you advise other women or just entrepreneurs, people in general, to sort of approach these big, clunky, complex, but key organizations in making that change? But you know, we are all uh, smart people. And I think sometimes we mustn't be scared. Right now, there's urgency. I think when you are going into government, which is just a, a system, you need to have a plan, first of all. Uh, and, and just have a plan and tell them, listen, I really want to help you know, one single... Governments are made in bricks. You know? And so if you want to change the identity, if you want to help identity, I want to give a proposal around identity or anything else, First of all, talk to the right people in government. There are champions in government, people who actually want to make a difference. The way I change policies in government, uh, for example, is just find having a, you know, a, a champion in government who really care about the internet. For example, if I want to get connectivity for my girls in Brazil, I need to really uh, get a, you know, go and talk to the telecom companies and talk to people in Brazil who really care about the fact that young girls need to have connectivity. If I give them connectivity, would they have laptops and stuff to read? And wh where is the content coming from? And I think before you go in, have a plan, I will say, and don't go aggressively, you know, go in with the, you know, the, the indication that you actually really are a citizen and you want to help your country. Uh, and, 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 and use it like, make it very simple, but go with a plan uh, and design it very clearly that I want to come and help you. This is my solution. And I think that if we use it as citizens, uh, is going to be helpful for us. And that's what I usually do. It's very complex. It's not very, very easy. But I try to find one single person in government who is a champion of change. Uh, and that person usually open a lot of doors. Uh, and and, and I, I, with my plan, usually things get done. What is some of the biggest challenges you've been facing over the past four months? Uh, or what is the biggest opportunity you have encountered through this uh, reflecting time we've all been through? <laughs> it's a very good question. You know, when I, I uh, in March, I was in Kakuma refugee camp, so I celebrated the International Women Week with my girls. So f 15 days, I was in a refugee camp, and uh, I was so safe there, I didn't want to come back. <laughs> I imagine. So, you know, so when I came I back to Denmark, <laughs> which is very safe at the moment, and I had to come back to Brazil, so I, I can relate uh, to the fear. So I had a lot of love from the girls and I was in a camp, in a refugee camp in, in Kenya where we have over 200,000 people there. Uh, they are refugees oh. from, uh, from different countries. And so I was there with them. And when I came back, there was a lockdown. And I've learned to, uh, I've launched a podcast. Uh, so I've launched so many, many different activities. Our mentoring program is still going on with the refugees. So I've learned different skills. But like I said earlier, I've also learned to ask for help. Uh, you know, I didn't know how to ask for help. I've learned that. And uh, I made new friends uh, and I'm learning the science of well-being. <laughs> I love that. So tell us a little bit about what, what made you, I think a lot of people, I'll touch on two points. A lot of people out there are thinking about how to tell their story and have an active voice uh, and making change. And I think a lot of us look at videos, opportunities like this, which are happening over three days of content and interactive uh, conversations. And some people would look at podcasts. What is, what is the one exciting thing or the scary thing that you had to get over to do a podcast yourself? Oh my God. First of all, I didn't know. So we have an amazing creative team in Japan. Um, and okay. so I've learned, so we, we have a series of called Resilient Souls. So I'm trying to find 
amazing people who have been through so much in their life. So I call them the Resilient Soul Series. And so I invite people for one hour and we talk about how they made it. You know, uh, some people, most of us are not used to, uh, you know, especially us, you know, we're not used to getting people to just listen to our stories and how we made it. So I got unusual people that you would never hear from. And I invited them to speak on the podcast. Uh, talk about their childhood, how they made it. And I think COVID-19 has made all of us vulnerable, made us uh, to want to be who we are because we just suffered and locked down and there's nothing we can do about it. And so I, I have used that to really help people to share more, to get more connected with themselves. Uh, and then the podcast is very popular now. The girls are listening to it in the refugee camp. Um, and I'm looking to get more people to come and share their stories. That I is think, exciting. Uh, that is amazing to hear their resilient stories. So I think that that's also a call out for everybody out there that might have an interesting story that wants to tell why they're resilient. Yeah. Second question I have for you is you talked about one of my favorite topics and certainly as you brought up Tom a few times as the founder of Meaningful Business. Mm -hmm. Him and I share, uh, we met the first time in a cafe in London to talk about financial services. And we ended up talking about our therapies. And we talked about mental health and the art of well-being, which is something you brought up. What are some of the key things you have sort of either developed yourself or collected along the way that has kept your entrepreneurial spirit and fight and fuel alive? Because I know, at least personally, it's, it's a daily struggle and it's a daily exercise and commitment to yourself before anything else. Absolutely. What are some of the learnings that have come yeah. for you? No, no, absolutely. You know, um, you, with the childhood I we had, uh, you know, we, we need to st we need to keep strong. But one thing I've learned during this lockdown is that fear. Uh, we need to we need to we can't fear fear anymore. We need to uh, you know be really start, you know, being being who we are. It's very hard all of this stuff that has been going on for the last four months. But I've been, you know, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist. I've been, become Buddhist uh, 15 years ago. So I meditate quite a lot. I try to be, live in a very simple way. Um, and I, I really try to be grateful for what I have. Uh, and I think all of us, despite we, we've been locked down and we can't see our families and our friends, we, you know, we, we have this, the, the basic necessities that uh, many people don't have. So. Yeah. My, my 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 philosophy for the last four months is just to live day by day, uh, to be grateful for what I have, to connect with friends, to talk to people, to check out, check in all the time with my friends, uh, not just on Zoom, but, you know, call them out and check them out to see if they're feeling well. Uh, you know, we're not all the same. We all have difficulty and sometimes we can't express how we feel. But I think that uh, checking on each other is really important. Um, not being judgmental, uh, loving each other more, those kind of things, those small details, sending cards, you know, uh, if the post office in your country is functioning, I've been sending a lot of letters <laughs> to my friends. So, you know, they love the letters. And I even wrote a, a letter to the girls in Kakuma and it made me cry because it was a lockdown letter. And then I didn't know they're going to listen to the podcast. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I heard they listened to it and they replied, they replied back through, through voice. Yeah, it was really nice. It sounds heartwarming and something that I certainly take for, for me to do a little bit more. I have to confess I'm a little low on the letters and maybe on the phone calls. I've been doing a lot of introspection and I've been doing a journal too. Um, it's a great lesson from one of my mentors. I've always starting my day with like three things I'm grateful for. For, and three things that are hurting me so you acknowledge your feelings but yeah. then you let go and you yeah. and you understand you can't do anything about them mm -hmm. as we as we live in this bubble mark uh, asked us a question here marco dons asked and said there is a great awakening there's greta extinction rebellion blm but he said something that i agree sometimes we feel like we exist in a little bubble and our world needs to change so how do we go about flipping um the scale and really getting a bigger audience. What do you think at a fundamental level needs to change for us to get a bigger audience and not just to be, as you said, a hashtag that we used in that particular day? Like I said earlier, we are really responsible. We as a community, uh, I, I mean, all of us, the creative industry, the tech industry, all of us, uh, because we are the producers of content. And now we, dis we need to decide who will be the consumers of content. Do we just want to stay in our own bubbles, in our own worlds, where everything is like very sudden? 
or do you want to actually reach out to many, many people? And I think my call all the time is, uh, you know, try to not to be too comfortable with the people just you know. And one of the things I've learned, for example, just like another example of Black Lives Matters, of all of these this activities happening across the world, we produce uh, content and we produce ideas. Our ideas become policies. Our ideas become advice. Your Everything you produce today around identity may change a country. So you are responsible for whatever you're producing, whatever you are giving to other organizations, other nations. So be careful what you produce. And because the consumers may not be the government straight away, it may be uh, the refugee camps. So whatever you are, the consumers may be, uh, may be, you know, it may be difficult for them. So we need to be really, very really careful as a, our society. That's why I'm calling for more humanity, uh, more uh, digital identity. We need to make it more empathetic, compassionate, and kind. Be careful what we write and what we say. Uh, don't always, you know, spend time on Twitter and, and all of the social media. Spend time to read about, uh, you know, colonialism or imperialism or learn about, you know, Gore Island in Senegal. You know, really, uh, we need to take our time to be more uh, aware of being a producer of ideas and content, but also who will be the consumers of our content. Because if we consume something bad, like the, you know, many people are consuming bad content, and then it's affecting your mental, your, your mental, mental health. You go on Instagram, you see people consuming, you know, they consume so many bad content. It affects your mental health. And then you go home, you feel small, you feel you haven't achieved anything. And then I think what I was saying, Tom, yesterday, post COVID-19, we're going to have this, I'm writing about this, the producers of ideas and the consumers of ideas, we need to collide somehow. Otherwise, they're going to be, it's going to be a bigger problem. And we've been having so many producers of ideas. But people also consuming what they shouldn't be consuming. Consuming, excuse my language, really bad stuff. Uh, so now we need to really find a way to make sure that uh, you know we're not consuming so many bad ideas. Because I've seen uh, when when you consume bad ideas like government, they they make uh, very bad policies that affects millions of people. So we need to be careful. Uh, I will say really my two things are: be careful what you produce and be careful what you consume. I couldn't agree more. It's a basic data principle, right? That we all know garbage in, garbage out. And I think as a person who is in technology, I think that that principle applies for us humanly. And I think it's really sad sometimes to see kids trading friends for followers or caring or measuring their worth on a photo or some it's sort broken. of status. <laughs> yeah, we've built, we've built a crazy world that I think uh, we need to take ownership and responsibility for changing. To Talking unlearn. about Exactly. I, I talk a lot about that as well, Lady Maryam. I talk a lot about unlearn. How are, how are we unlearning even the childhood stories that we've told ourselves that might be harming us or weighing us down in our progress forward? In terms of unlearning, I, I think one of the sectors that has the most amount of unlearning, in my opinion, is the private sector. Um, they've established things and taken the atom market hand to the teeth without having consequences and perhaps a little slightly Machiavellian for my taste. How do you see the private sector playing a role in that? And to the people, to the 100 and 200, I don't even know how many people are here today listening, what can they do? And if they're working in the private sector, how can they get engaged? And, and, and what can they be thinking about? I mean, that's a very good point. The private sector, my biggest take on the private sector right now is really to look to to to, to look back into, again, consuming uh, and, and brands like, you know, because we, we all of us go and work with brands. You know, we are all looking for the private sector to fund our project, fund our events, uh, you know, do the, you know, most, most of us are looking for, for customers and, and partners. And so I think one of the things we need to do as a society, as a community, uh, and I hope that Mission Impossible and, and Tom and, and you will, uh, you know, have a think about this, uh, you know, after this, after this three days activity, it's really to, uh, you know, go inside and, and talk to pr the private sector, uh, you know, have a, 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 di a different design. I would say we need to more bring empathy in the design process. You know, when we're asking questions, you know, brands, you know, what do we want? The, how can we forget refugees into our work? You know, how can we forget my girls in favelas sitting down right now, over 700 of them waiting for me to send them money so they can connect? 
uh, you know, things like th those details. But it will take one single telecom company to give me connectivity for, for, the, for our girls. So but what are we trying to do as a society? So I think that's what I will say, the private sector. They have a massive, massive uh, role to do. And they, we need to really push them very hard. And we must not be afraid of pushing the private sector to do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, 10 years from now, we cannot celebrate the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2030 when companies have not done their bit. It's not just going online and saying, I'm, I'm, you can't just say I'm supporting this organization. I've given $100 million to XYZ organization. And then we need to stop the pledges. No more pledge. We need cash, pure cash into my bank account. No pledges. Forget about the pledges. So many pledges for decades, no money. No money. You can't see the cash. So we need to make sure that when they pledge, we need to see the data need to, they, there should be the evidence about you know, at last couple of weeks ago, I saw people pledging about hundred million dollars. I can promise you, no one will see this money. So we need to really also educate them and refuse to participate in in what they're doing. We have to say no. We're not participating. And then if you start doing that, they, then it, it should be an education somehow. You know, I know we all need money. We all need to work with companies, but we need to stop participating in these fraudulent activities. I couldn't agree more. Like. Uh... Uh, Lady Mary Ann, I think I think there is a fundamental flaw in in how we've structured even the infrastructure of how we look at corporate social responsibility, how we've looked at these at these pledges, and and even how we've looked at so many what make, what ownership do they have? Like, I don't mm -hmm. want just money. I want supply chain access. I want um, support. API access, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Education, technology, IP. Like, I think that there is a even when I look at the world of, honestly, tax evasion, financial crime, and these schemes, like we have used humans' creativity to structure ways in which corporations have just been able to say, I'm good enough. I just play around the tax system and ruin, ruin entire communities. And I think coming from a developing country and having had the privilege effectively to be educated and work abroad I can't help but to come back here in Brazil and other countries I've been privileged to go to and see the impact of the lack of ownership yeah but I think that I think that's one of the main missions I think speaking on behalf of Tom but but certainly as a partner is is how do you bring this ownership I yes I won the money because the money unfortunately is the way the world goes around today but what if we looked at it as what is the impact currency but also we've been very um, comfortable we've been very comfortable for decades and decades and decades we've been comfortable and i was just giving yes, yesterday an example about make poverty history for decades and decades we participated in these fraudulent activities and this corruption i will say it's called intellectual corruption and so we've been participating in these activities for decades and i think what covid 19 have showed us is everyone slow down please let's reset the button so that's why the world economic forum is going to organize the great reset we need to reset the button and say, this is not what right. you afford because you need money to go and, 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 and run your business. But for you to get, you know, as a woman to get money to run your business is a struggle. So, but you know, and then the next day you listen, you hear, oh, hundred million dollar pledge for gender equality, but how can you get access to that money? And so we need to also be careful. Uh, and that's why I'm saying we need to really say no to companies but give me the money because I need to go and actually help my people. You know, we need to do some work. But for many, many years, the same companies, the same people, the same gangs, the same friends, the same circles, uh, they've been running the world, making money behind our backs and, and giving us little money, small, tiny bit. And then you see them online, on TV, and, and really lying to the whole world. And now post-COVID-19, everybody's like, oh my God, I'm totally exposed now. I don't know what to do. So post COVID-19, we need to really change this attitude. And I'm, that's what I'm calling to private sector and government to really start thinking about, you know, look into themselves, look into themselves. Do you really want to see in 2030, how can we advance the sustainable development goals? Goal by goal, it's not just like a publicity, but what can we do to make sure that girls in Kenya, in Kakumo refugee camp, 200,000 of them, have access to connectivity. My girls in favelas in Brazil, they have connectivity, they have laptops, iPads, content, so they can learn like any single girl in the world. So don't give me this big hoo-ha climate change conversation and getting just one single person, elevating one single person and then and, and forget about the other people, but give me connectivity, uh, infrastructure, 
and content so my girls can learn about the world. You can do that, though we can partner. You can't do that, sorry. And Don't waste my time, right? <laughs> Because for years and years and years, and I think that's why I like this mission, Impossible, they will, find, they will think it's impossible, but it's not impossible. Because if you get a champion in government and you go and tell him this in a very clear way, they will give you the fund. It's not difficult to find laptops uh, for girls. It's not difficult to get connectivity. It's not difficult to create content. I mean, all of us, we are a, you know, a plethora of content. We can all help young girls growing up across the world. Why don't we do it? I just don't understand. You have many, many go, Lady Maryam, go. I am wowed and mind shifted questions. I've got goosebumps going on over here. And I think it's, it's, so, it's inspiring, Lady Maryam. I'm excited to see how Meaningful Business Entail partners with you and I am co to create content that really shifts the mind and helps us pause and really have a paradigm of what is the world we wanna build? How do we wanna look? back and see the impact that we had and and what kind of values did we live by yeah, people like you we... people like you bianca you have got the power and tom and all of this that's why i like you and you know the tom and the partnership you've done because you know and, and that's why i like you guys because it's important that we have the courage to say no it's called intellectual corruption i promise you for many years system failed me as a child the reason why i did not go to school i did not have degree from harvard or from cambridge and from whatever because the system failed me. So now I'm not sitting down waiting for system to fail all the millions of girls if I can help them. So we need to really think about this very carefully as we go post COVID-19, we go back to our offices, we connect again, we go to our little places, meet our friend, having coffees and things like that. Don't buy Starbucks coffee if they don't help black people. Don't buy Starbucks coffee if they don't help girls. They have money, these people. So they need to put the money where their mouth is. Go and help people. Come with me in Kakumo refugee camp. Go and meet the girls. 200,000 people live in the refugee camp. It's like a prison. So, and then for years and years and years, we've been watching them uh, do all of this. So I say post COVID-19, we need to stop intellectual corruption, refuse to work with them, say no, until you give me money to go and do identity workshop in Kakuma, then we can work together. If you don't want to do that, sorry, thanks. I'll find someone else. I love this interview and this time with you. Honestly, I, I appreciate, I want to take a moment to personally thank you for your energy, for the work that you do is inspiring and makes me feel less crazy, which is at a, at a selfish level, really enlightening. Um, and I think everybody here, you have um, lots of commands. I, and I think um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, Lady Miriam and your initiative, I am the code is more than welcome to, we'll share here guys, all the contacts so you can get involved and you can put your ideas heart and typing fingers where your mouth is and really actually do tangible work like Marianne said, because we need it.